Hey, Anton, uh, thank you for coming in. You've got a really remarkable background, uh, you know, as a as a coder, as, as a tech person, a tech guru, uh, together with design and an AI and uh, pretty much everything that you've done has been uh, pretty notable, including with WhatsApp, uh, you know, one of the uh, gentlemen that really grew that to be a huge uh, platform and and uh, just being uh, really thoughtful and mindful um, throughout the world, including Ukraine, where you have a nonprofit. So uh, just just a remarkable history of accomplishments. So thank you for coming in and sharing your insights with our audience. Thanks for having me, Stephen. It's always a great time for me to talk to you. So happy to do it over the Zoom interview. So so Anton, you know my audience actually consists. Um, uh, professors and students and tech experts, a lot of engineers, but actually the top five positions are CEOs, founders, board members, presidents, people like that. It tend to be really senior executives. And then in sixth place would be things like professors, students, uh, and uh, engineers. Um, so considering that audience and sort of the very broad perspective they're looking for, you know, what would be those magic moments in your life? I call them inflection points that created this wonderful career and person that you are today, Anton. And it could have been something when you were like three or four. It could have been um, something that happened in when you were in early in school. It could be a mentor, a family member. Uh, and then throughout your career, there's probably at least two, maybe three, where it created this incredible journey you've been on. It's hard to probably like remember all of them, but few things definitely stand out. And I'm thinking this kind of like this internal honesty about what you want to do with your life. And if you want to go along with other teams or people, or do you want to go on your own for some time? So I guess uh, this is where the core of entrepreneurship is is kind of like you know i want to do something by myself and i'm i'm happy to do it and i even if it's scary like i'll try to do to do it so this stepping into the unknown even if the kind of like the things you have are comfortable and uh, you know it's it's working all right but stepping out and trying to do something again uh zero to one is something where um it worked for me multiple times and uh from the agency i was working at to creating my own studio and from you know stepping from whatsapp again and joining the team that is basically less than 10 people uh it was neva so yeah it it worked for me all right so what created this sort of zero to 100 kind of capability, this entrepreneurship uh, sort of uh, direction that you've taken throughout your life uh, and this product design, was it a family member or, or an early teacher, some, somebody that kind of mentored you or inspired you? I mean, I was growing up uh, in parallel with technology, basically picking up steam and I've seen personal computers, how they appeared and it's definitely very inspiring like especially for a kid like i remember uh soldering my first computer together with dad and like going to his workplace to uh try first computers it's it's incredible and uh i guess when you have uh, this interesting things that happen i started with kind of like oh yeah i'll probably have to do something with this i have i have to create something with this and i started obviously as an more of an engineer like i was thinking yeah i'm going to be software engineer like we, we we're calling this like i'm going to be a programmer like <laughs> I, it was simple simpler terms back then and uh i started doing this like and it was going all right but kind of like i noticed like over and over again so i want to basically cover full experience not just you know logical part but how it works how people feel when they try to interact with what i'm building so obviously eventually over and over i chose kind of like this activity over basically coding things up and um besides that i think that i just get procrastinated 
uh, procrastinating when I'm doing more of a coding thing. So like more and more, I want to product -y things and design things so in my life. So what I'm hearing then is um, you had this really early interest in just the hardware aspect, building things, and your family helped shape some of that journey uh, because you'd go to their place of work and you were able to get infused in this kind of environment. So, and so that would have inspired some aspects of you, but you think so much more broadly. Uh, where do you think you got this sort of design feeling to you? I mean, um, again, it was just naturally infused into you or, or it was something happened in school perhaps or a friend or... I guess it's just multiple things. Like the, the earliest... I know things where I start to remember I was inspired by design or by, um, you know, the simplicity or cultural aspects of like how people do things in real life, like physically and visually, uh, was like stamps. My father also tried to kind of like get me into collecting stuff. Like he was a collector, I'm not, but like the exposure to some visual cultures of different countries like and seeing how like you could see a lot more depth even from the way things look on paper like on a small piece you could imagine all the culture that is there in the country and uh in similar way like i was maybe 10 years old and my father was building uh spaceships <laughs> uh and uh they had japanese delegation and in my culture, getting this like perfectly white embossed uh, business card when you're like about nine or 10, it's a magical experience. Like we didn't have that quality of printing or that quality of, you know, like care for things in front of you. Like, and it was like, I keep going to this example again, again, and again, and uh just basically natural sensibilities that, yeah, obviously I was uh, studying music. I was playing piano as a kid, like all of the things that you, your parents usually can kind of try to make you do growing up and dance and things like this. I think it helps for sure. Just um, attending to those talents in yourself and combining them into something that is actually helpful to other people people when they need to build something that's i think right so your father was in air, aerospace then as you said about rockets and things like that yeah, yeah yeah if you remember uh sea launch program uh ukraine together with uh us at some point he was uh you know part of this team and he was going back and forth to california and back to meet Boeing. So you'd be immersed in this uh, very uh, modern kind of engineering aspect and space space engineering is so, aerospace engineering is really at the forefront. And I was not immersed, immersed, but like I, I was seeing my dad doing this over his life, but. Yeah, but then you said you, you saw this, uh, this Japanese delegation came and you saw their cards and that really. Yeah. Like, you no, you see, I was inspired by business card more than what they were doing with space. <laughs> but it was because the design was so interesting to you, right? Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, uh, you did you studied music, but then that gives you sort of a very interdisciplinary background. And when you have an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary background, then it, it unlocks all of this sort of creative capability. So I can see all of this. So. What was your first job then uh, that you that you took um, early in your career? So basically, it was a freelance. I was helping some like internet happened and businesses understood that they probably need to do some kind of website for them. And this is was my first uh, probably freelance job. And immediately after that, I just. Uh, learned if you remember macromedia flash was uh this very interesting interactive uh programming environment where you could create 
uh, interactive things. And I did a few and that helped me to start working full time while I was still a college student year three. So it was kind of like, you know, very hard to make those two things work. And uh, the first company I started to work in was basically me doing uh, flash intros for different companies, for for different websites. And uh, yeah, that's how it started. And uh, uh, it was very interesting because this company was, uh, it was before first.com crash. So all the companies that sort were quite interesting. It was hard to understand why would people uh, build websites about stamps, for example. So that's that's quite a fascinating then. And then uh, you you were the head of design at Neva, which is like an AI powered ad free private personal search engine. Um, you spent a decade long tenure at WhatsApp. Can you talk about how you got hired by WhatsApp? And then spending ten years at WhatsApp, and, and what was what, what was that like? I'm growing this so yeah. user base to like over a billion users. That was uh, uh, at my previous company before I started my own studio. I was doing some projects for Yahoo, like that was Yahoo Games and uh, some other events for Yahoo, and we were doing both design and we were also converting some game products of yahoo games from uh, java back then to flash which was more modern and more um, interactive and nice so that kind of like got me connected to yahoo folks and i when i left the this company and started my own studio jan reached out to me through one of his uh friends who i was working with together so like we had common friends uh, and that helped me start basically before whatsapp was an app store Jan asked me to design a logo design a website design first few icons for whatever it was back then it was not even a messenger it was an app to exchange statuses like if you have address book uh so you can see your friend names and next to the name that would be kind of like uh, my batteries dying or I'm in Germany, use this number instead. So that was just uh, one of the several clients I had back at the time and didn't really think much of that. It was uh, nothing special. Like it was special in terms of it was first iPhone app that I started to think about and design. I had to... You know, like the the stage of apps on iPhone was interesting. It was kind of like, you know, first, uh, you know, beer drinking apps and lab rings and like, you know, fart apps, like nothing really uh, like useful to people. And, you know, because of, uh, and I guess AI environment is kind of like in a similar stage, like uh, were not a lot of apps, like truly apps, like technological demos. Yes, like it's it's there, it's it's available. But I see the same place in the industry uh, now as it was in 2009. So like some connection here. Yeah, and so like you said, uh, you were really the first designer at the company. You created their iconic logo, double check marks. I mean, eventually building and supporting a global design team. And and what made you decide to eventually move on from WhatsApp uh, and to other companies and to your own work, right? I guess uh, a lot of people who were early at WhatsApp were at the time when they were leaving company. And uh, definitely compared to the early team where you work on a product mostly where like it's uh, the, the, the speed of how you build things is very fast. Uh, I think it just become more, you know, people oriented and corporate oriented and uh, i think like politics start to happen and just kind of like you know you get lured to like new invitations that come in that okay like do you want to do another zero to one like you know come 
join the company that is doing something interesting that's kind of like just being created. And um, Jim from Sequoia connected me with Shidar. Like at the last year, I was uh, this WhatsApp and I had uh, a few coffee uh, meetups with Shidar and team. And yeah, I decided to join a new company, which was thinking about uh, building something in search space. Uh, and it was interesting for me because I believe uh, the like success of WhatsApp was and partly because the things that are being sent in the, you know, conversation uh stream and feed is kind of like has to be very rich and creating the language for people like visual interactive language for people to actually like allow them to have a deeper conversation was something similar that i didn't see this built with search so like i was yeah i'll probably go and try and build something richer for a search experience. And this was easy for me to accept this offer and join a team uh, from the very small size. So that's really, really fascinating. Uh, now I can see your journey from rocket uh, aerospace engineering rockets to uh, uh, soldering computers together and interest in coding. But um, this broader interest because of your music and, and being inspired by this logo of a Japanese delegation. And so there's the design, the technology part of it as well. And then you end up at WhatsApp and up heading up uh, design there and creating some really iconic aspects of that organization and really helping to grow it from zero to over a billion users. And then you end up head of design at Neva, AI powered ad free private personal search engine. It's another challenge, more opportunity from early, from the it's early beginning, and then and then let's continue that journey. What did you do next? So after Neva, I decided to start doing my own uh, startup to as a founder, and I was uh, building my first prototype, and I guess. Uh, first few months it's what was going really great and then um, the war in ukraine happened and it was hard for me to think about anything else and i created my nonprofit back then and uh, uh, we were doing a lot of humanitarian help for ukraine and uh, helping people uh, like struggling and what's interesting my connections to uh Facebook and Meta really helped because uh, the help to people in Instagram or Facebook to help unblock people who were blocked uh, for some random reasons, like it was like re really helpful. Like I think like it was uh, quite an interesting because we unblocked about, I don't know, 50 to 100 people that were like you know, just regular citizens uh, trying to care for their own country. So like it was um, quite, quite an experience for me. And after uh, first year, I think I started to get some free time back and joined a new fund, which was a VC focused fund together with folks from uh, who I met with WhatsApp. So I First, I started this fund as an LP, as a limited partner, and uh, it was a fund about AI, which, you know, like has some uh, play in my life. And um, after being an LP for a couple of years, I decided maybe it's a good time and opportunity for the new funds that have been created to join as a full-time partner. And this is what we did. And uh, the fund is uh, mostly looking into how to bring this, you know, amazing technologies that happens to more people. So like how, like what next set of experiences hasn't been yet created and who are the founders that are going to create this next experience similar to WhatsApp, but in the AI, AI age uh, and help those founders to succeed in their way. So like now I'm a full-time uh, venture partner in this 
uh, fund called Strat Mines. And uh, yes, that's basically all I'm doing right now. So I see this transition from um, working with startup, or you did your own startup, and then and then the war happens, and then you created this uh, fund called the Sunflower Fund, which is dedicated to providing protective medical equipment to the region, to Ukraine. And then um, you have this interest in, in venture capital, so you end up being an LP, a limited partner, which is an investor in the fund, and then eventually you become a partner in the fund called Strap Mines, a San Francisco-based VC fund, and you're really doubly down on applied AI with this. Uh, but because of your background, and it's so diverse, that would be make it a, a perfect uh, combination for being mm -hmm. a partner, right? Because uh, having this interdisciplinary feel to you, combining sort of the artistic side with the venture side, with entrepreneurship, with uh, always being at the boundaries. That's like the confluence of everything that's ideal to be a partner, not strat, strat minds, uh, this uh, San Francisco-based VC firm. So, and you're doubly down on AI. So now let's let's get into this. Um, you, you see in all of this aspect of the large foundation models, what, what are your feelings about um, chat GBT and, and cloud too? And, you know, all, all of these things that are happening in the generative AI space, uh, do you think that's uh, really promising? It's going to continue in that journey? I mean, what's your feelings about uh, AI in general and, you know, what makes for great investments, do you think? I think, uh, like for me personally, it was quite a transformative experience to see this thing actually work. Yes, I get it. Like we have about like 60% it is right and 40% it's wrong. And it's hard to, to have a trustful relations with something that is lying to you like 30% of the time. But I see the power and I see the value for sure in, in how this uh, models that we built can help basically not replace people, but uh, augment and amplify people. So I'm seeing a lot of um, use for people, especially in the areas of retrieval augmented generation, where something that's real and connecting you to something that's real and that you didn't knew before and making unexpected connections. So I'm thinking like if Google allows you to get to something that's there and exists, uh, ChatGPT will allow you to make uh, some more full pictures and combine all of your context together in one thing. Similarly, how, you know, in our humans' careers, all of this diverse background and connections allow us to be this unique uh, roles and personalities and careers that combine all of the backgrounds. I'm thinking that uh, the products we'll build next will help you more in this journey. It will allow you to connect all of your talents and sensibilities and taste and skills, uh, but bring it together uh, with the help of the models that are being created now. Like so far, uh, current models are mostly kind of like single model or unit model, uh, but I could see how we build next generation of models that are multi-model and how uh, the chaining sets would be not just text and images, but emotions, video and uh, temperature and some other things. And, uh, uh, you know, so it, it will allow you to blend more things and bring more things together in something much more powerful than like and amplify your capabilities. So, you know, Anton, uh, you are an investor. I mean, you're a partner in Strat uh, Mines, uh, this uh, San Francisco-based VC firm, doubly down on applied AI. Uh, you have this great technical design background. Have you actually played with some of the open source models, like actually downloading them onto your laptop and <laughs> and just uh, try to fine tune them in some way or, or do, you know, uh, do some uh, additional sort of uh, fine tuning. I'm thinking a llama too because you get you it, you know they already have the pre-trained model. They have the 
the uh... yeah i think a few of our partners are doing this things downloading open open source models and i see a lot of you know things happening with mistral and uh you know you see uh models with like less parameters being able to work even on the uh, mobile phones like i haven't done anything like on on mobile phone but i did download it for uh my laptop and uh i tried olama last time but what i'm doing it so far is basically i'm trying to fine tune it on the actual documents and relevant materials from my life and uh it i was successful in a lot of queries that i was trying to to build and to talk to the data corpus of mine but definitely it's just uh you know, like this is open source. It's a similar how people are playing with command line tools, like not really like it's powerful, but not really democratized. I'm waiting to the point where it's going to be kind of like basically your mom will be able to use it or like uh, your grandma will be able to use it. So it's kind of like, you know, people who are from previous generation. And I think like uh, mobile phones were kind of like similar trajectory like where it started from command line interface and basically just a few professors and engineers were able to use it like i don't know like 100 people total on ours but then you build some interfaces and something that's more easy to understand and interact with uh that eventually billions of people can use it so i'm waiting for uh, you know, the time and products built that will allow you not to kind of like, you know, download and compile all the models on your computer and try to kind of like manually connect it with code tools, but bring it to uh, larger populations. And uh, th that that's what is, inspires me more. Have, have you tried? Uh, so speaking about this democratization of AI, I mean, ChatGPT came out and everybody plays with it, uses it. Uh, GPT-4 Turbo is out, GPT Vision is out. And then they came out with GPT Builder, where you, just a, a regular person, create their own agent, do some reinforce uh, this sort of uh, uh, additional retrieval augmentation generation, just sort of rag uh, kind of fine tuning of it, just by giving it additional documents and that. And right. I've looked at it and played with it a bit. I mean, anybody could do it. To me, it seems pretty simple. Have you, what do you think, or have you tried it? And in fact, I work with a nonprofit, and we needed something that would work with uh, a, a conflict or a conflict resolution. So, so one of one of our board members actually went online to that uh, ChatGPT builder and uh, just get it, gave it additional information, and, and I tested it the other day, and it's actually pretty good. Uh, just by giving it additional data, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think like uh, that's why I believe retrieval of meta generation will definitely be a big part of uh, of the play in the coming years. And I personally tried myself like as a board member of Santa Barbara Zen Center while well, well, I was trying to kind of like find relevant relevant information and bylaws in the previous conversations we had as a board, kind of like to help bring. Uh, team to speed and find some resolutions. So I'm thinking in governance, and this is immensely help helpful. Uh, the ability to actually uh, invite someone who can com combine all the information from the context you had and find creative materials and answer questions on based on your prompts. Yeah, and then, then you could add it to their. I guess they're uh, coming up with an app store of some sort. You could add it to their, to their app store, and and if right. you look at uh, Microsoft Visual Studio and and what you can do with uh, Azure uh, AI or Azure Open AI, I mean, they're, they're, it's pretty seamless and and easy to get get to even even as a um, a developer who hasn't been in this area. What are your thoughts about that? Where that's going to evolve, uh, you know, from a developer tools standpoint? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of interesting developments happening on uh, development productivity. And one of the things that inspired me recently is multimodality. So kind of like, you know, show and tell at the same time. And kind of like, you know, take this piece of code. And this is like, I've seen prototypes people build. 
So people use the voice that kind of like, uh, can you look at this error and make sure that this piece of uh, code works, but also look at this. And I also don't want to use like type definitions. So the amount of context that you are able to uh, have uh, for the things you build can be more when you use similar streams of information at the same time. So using your body was kind of like, you know, showing using your voice and using the typed input. So all of this at the same time. And you could see one of the recent acquisitions that was major in Loom. I see Loom in a way as a multimodal, uh, which, which combines two streams at the same time. So you can have your video and emotional stream and uh, voice at the same time when you're showing something on the screen. And I definitely believe there's going to be more uh, products like this, both for regular people and also for developers, where multiple streams are combined in the same experience. And then you get into like um, Autogen that Microsoft came out with, but there's other and it was like these um, agents that came out uh, uh, where it's sort of automated, <laughs> self self uh, improving, and uh, that could go through the roof, right? Because it's yeah. the, it's the and even if you look at uh, these uh, open source models like Oracle two, released uh, by Microsoft, and its performance and it's small, its performance is like a, a, a GPT four. Anyways, maybe not terrible, but it's like a GPT four. Performance. I mean, just a kind of amazing where this is going. So, what are your thoughts then? You you saw this sort of uh, news about Q Sharp or this uh, not Q Sharp Q Learning. Q -Sharp. Uh, do you think that's real? And, and do you think that's sort of like the next evolution? And it's 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 not just from them. I see more people seeing the next general architecture that is not just transformers, but something like actionable transformers that assign reward not to next word, but maybe to more of an action and to more of an, you know, agentic behavior. And I guess this is kind of like, you know, multimodality I'm talking to. So it's not just kind of like, you know, predicting text. It's about predicting outcomes and predicting, uh, Raging next possible actions you can take. And I definitely see that it's not just them who are building this. Like, I, I will see it, uh, you know, like when the paper about Transformers uh, attention is all you need happened. Basically, uh, it's uh, it went into a lot of uh, different uh, implementations and people started to experiment with this. And, you know, it just... It's great that we have this open source community that uh, tries to bring this and democratize the discoveries that we made in, make in AI. And you, you see this work on things like originally it was sort of like, how can we improve these things? And there was this chain of thought and then it became a tree of thought and then it became algorithm of thought and then I see the system two attention paper that came out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was interesting. Uh, so, are you uh, are you able to follow all of these papers? I mean, they're just no, no. It's like, not possible to follow all of them. I like I have a limited amount of time in my hands, and uh, but definitely I try to. Uh, this summer we went to uh, ICML conference in Honolulu with all the partners, and it's just kind of like mind is blowing when you get to the room with three hundred of posters at the same time, and I try to kind of like understand at least like a few papers. And what's interesting, actually, uh, for the things I did not understand, I tried to ask Chat GPT right on the spot, kind of like, you know, can you help explain this topic? Or can you like, you know, what bandits mean or like whatnot? So, uh, yeah, that's uh, like the speed of progress and the scientific discoveries we have these days is, is pretty great. Like some of this is purely optimizational, though, kind of like how do you make this thing uh, performing kind of like 10% faster or 50% faster? It's definitely helpful. 
Uh, but some of them are transformational, kind of like, you know, how do you bring this uh, technology and uh, instead of not working, that actually starts working like with uh, transformers and intention. So, and, and this is, uh, there's been controversy about AGI, you know, I, I remember because I've been in this field for a long time, people were thinking AGI was like 100 years out or 50 years out. Now many people, even Jeffrey Hinton came out this year and said, Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I think, or I, I recommend people, I, I don't want to paraphrase them, but recommend people look at his original statements. But my my interpretation is, is that Jeff was thinking that maybe these things are more efficient than even how the human brain works, uh, or better in some ways. It's not human, but it's it could be even better. And so do you think we're on the crux of AGI, artificial general intelligence, within the next maybe five to 10 years? Or are you in the camp where it's now it's 20 or 50 years out? Uh, what I'm thinking is that um, my belief it's not going to get there until it's embodied like we are. <laughs> embodied, right. <laughs> so the emotions and, uh, you know, the amount of neurons in our brain that is uh, helping this machine work, like our bodies, is mostly... 95%. So like for us to move in the space and uh, keep our bodies alive as homeostasis and everything else is 95% of our brains and cortex is about five, right? So kind of like this cognition that you add on top of this uh, bodily like bag of meat is just 5%. So uh, I think that and I think this is where my Zen background and the uh, explorations in, in Buddhism help, uh, where I'm less pessimistic about the future of uh, AGI. I don't think it's going to kill us all and uh, things like this. I still think that um, how intelligence develops is uh, to include in more. So basically, uh, the larger the intelligence is built, the more reality it can contain, uh, including kind of like coexistence of all living beings. And I guess uh, saving all sentient beings could be one of the uh, ways to say that AGI is going to be developed into. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to unpack in, in, in this conversation right now. You talk about uh, you need embodiment, right, in some way. And if you look at the research in, in uh, organoids, brain organoids, they'll actually replicate the development even of a human fetus uh, brain up to a certain point, maybe 10 months to a year, and then it stops. And even the brain patterns, right, you, you actually get uh, EEG brain patterns almost duplicating what's happening in, in fetuses and then it stops and then, then then the thinking is it needs embodiment and then through embodiment then you can get much of a, a fuller context so it's it you see this correspondence between neuroscience and then you know what's happening with these uh, machine learning models and, and where they're going so but like you said it's multimodal and there's attempts of embodiment with uh, some of the uh, robotic architectures that are coming out. So do you think we're going to have this kind of embodiment capability with AGI? Because the two sides are this confluence, a convergence is happening in, in the near term. And and then I guess this gets into the whole sort of uh, spirituality aspect. Maybe, you know, um, uh, as, the, as these things become more intelligent, then maybe there will be a, a bigger capacity to see this sort of innate intelligence and maybe in plants and all mm -hmm. types of life forms. And then, then you get into uh, uh, Roger Penrose and this idea of, you know, sentience or intelligence as some kind of quantum property that's out there, except it's coherent in humans. And that's why we're able to do what we're doing. So anyway, so some additional thoughts about all of that. And then from a time frame, do you think with multimodality, we're going to get something really in the near term? Uh, I don't see the tempo of development slowing. You know? <laughs> so uh, it just depends on us how we can basically bring this innovation back to people. Like, and uh, 
how do we empower and democratize uh, this what we built and uh, yeah i think the trickiest part is that we are kind of like hungry for this great experience uh, but this great experience comes at the cost of the energy cost and in in terms of kind of like training and compute costs and uh, electricity so like we still have to be cautious about like uh, and uh, similar to how we trained ourselves kind of like okay sugar is bad for you like what comes into you know like we have to turn switches off and uh, you know like be conscious about water and uh, life about us like we don't see these direct correlations with experience we use with uh, AI products and the uh, environment. So I guess like thinking more about these connections and uh, learning how to build things more consciously uh, will definitely help. And uh, yeah. It, you know, it's interesting you're bringing up sort of the computational costs, the energy costs and so on, but then you have uh, neuromorphic chips, which are which use much less energy. There's analog computing getting a lot more attention again because it uses much more, uh, much less energy. I should say. So these neuromorphic chips use much less energy. With uh, resistive RAM, these new 3D architectures use much less. In fact, the more we get to model what's happening in the human brain and and the silicon, uh, then you actually end up being more efficient, energy efficient. So it's interesting where that will go and uh, building these uh, different models. But I want to get to Zen. How did you get into Zen? Because you're part of this uh, uh, Jacoji Zen Center, I believe, and then the Santa Barbara's Zen Center. I hope I pronounced it right. But And you recently joined the board of directors at uh, S SBZC, right? So how did you get into this, all of this area? Um, it was, uh, quite random to be honest, <laughs> like I had about a week between my, uh, time at WhatsApp and Neva. So I just had a week break between two drops and like my desire was kind of like, you know, I have to use this week to the fullest <laughs> and to kind of like recover, uh, to the best, uh, possible way. And, uh, I opened Yelp on my phone and started to look for retreats. And uh, the one I found uh, was pretty close by in the mountains uh, next to where we live. And um, they have about four yearly uh, week-long retreats, uh, week-long meditation practice sessions. And uh, basically, the day I started this look, it was one of these four. <laughs> that kind of like I understood that understood this as a sign. So kind of like if it's happening it's just four times a year, I don't know nothing about it. But it but it starts today. I'll probably just go. <laughs> so and yeah, that uh, got me to connect into all of this amazing people and teachers and lineages and people who. Uh, brought this uh, practice to states from Japan and other parts of the world. And, uh, you know, I, I'm i happy that it's still a living practice. So it's uh, because it's coming from more dogmatic to less the dogmatic environment. People are still kind of like, you know, like you don't know what you're doing. So just kind of like, you know, whatever works. Uh, and uh, it helps to you know do the kind of like you know interesting and honest practice with like all curiosity that i have yeah i, I mean it's fascinating how your life has expanded um, and and what was sort of happen chance in a way becomes now a major part of your life to the point now that you're passionate about integrating life into product and design and you've been studying at uh, buildingbeauty.org. Uh, and it's really quite, can you talk about that? Yeah, this is another, I guess, thing uh, where the blending between building things for people and both digital and real world is also interesting for me. And uh, 
um, the works of Christopher Alexander, this design theorist and architect and thinker, uh, inspired not just the generational of architects. In, in fact, uh, not all architects uh, like Christopher Alexander's work. It inspired a lot of computer uh, enthusiasts and engineers and builders and uh, it impacted the way open uh, um, objective-oriented program programming happened or Gang of Four book uh, happened and Wikipedia happened also because of um, where Kamen Cunningham tried to build the tool to host all the patterns from the, his book Pattern Language. So uh, it's uh, interesting how things in one discipline inspire development in neighboring uh, disciplines. And for me, it's also interesting because it's a combination of, you know, where we feel alive in this world. Um, just like you can imagine, like feel in older, you know, village or where you go narrow streets and how you feel when you're kind of like next to a highway uh, without the car standing on its own. It's kind of like, you know, quite a different feels that you have and uh, getting the information about the feelings and making this information kind of like, you know, very important in how you build the next thing you try to build. Uh, in, in embedding feelings, embedding like your humanity into what you built and making sure the things you build feel alive in a way. That kind of like got me into studying more of uh, Christopher Alexander's work and uh, eventually joining this program. I don't do a lot. Basically, it was just four years a week, four hours a week last year and even less this year. Uh, but definitely helps you to talk to people who who are like minded and uh, try to bring this feeling part. And I guess uh, there is a lot of uh, Zen stuff and there is a lot of cosmology stuff uh, in his way of thinking. And over time, he went was just systematizing and making more of mental. Um, you know, tools and synthesis and breaking down and all, everything into patterns that work together, creating language out of it. He eventually went to more, I would say, cosmological ways of thinking about how we build stuff, like how things happen around us, how nature structures itself into from, uh, you know, simplicity to complexity. And, uh, um, yeah, that's uh, that is still very interesting to me. I try to uh, dedicate this part of my time to kind of like enrich my practice and both helping founders uh, how to build stuff and just to keep my curiosity alive. You know, it's interesting because of what you're talking about. Then, have, have you looked at the work of Patty Mays at MIT Media Labs and her research group because they, she's working in this area. And it's done some pretty amazing uh, stuff. And, and some of her young research are just extraordinary that are part of your team. Have, have you looked at some of her? I work? have to take a look. Uh, maybe, yeah, this this is, sounds new to me. Uh, um, definitely. I need I to do an introduction look. if you're interested. So, sure. Yeah, I would be happy to. Okay, I'll, I'll do that as a follow-up. So I'm just actively brainstorming with you right now. Yeah, I think you you would find her work uh, really interesting, and, and um, especially her younger researcher, his name is Pat, uh, just remarkable thinking, and it, I would say it very much integrates to where you're going. Um, you're also into um, connecting designers with businesses and publishing books about design and unfolding life. Can you talk about that? So... All of this interest that I, I shared with you during this talk, I try to share and uh, I helped to publish a couple books in Ukraine, one of translations of Christopher Alexander's work and one is a uh, uh, Ukrainian translation of Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. If you know about this book, this is one of the top uh, five books so of Steve Jobs, and uh, it was written by 
Suzuki Roshi, who was a founder of San Francisco Zen Center, and he uh, basically uh, had this book, book uh, written by his students who taped the recordings of conversations after they uh, had morning sits. And uh, I try to make more connections based on what my interests are and bringing um, some of it back to Ukraine. And uh, since I was active in Ukraine design scene, uh, when I was, uh, when I had my studio and uh, now I'm trying to connect founders uh, from Ukraine to Bay Area networks and connect designers from Ukraine to startups in here in Bay Area. So like that just a natural uh, part of my, I guess, background and uh, just like easy to do. Like I'm, I'm, I naturally like to connect people. So it just happens. Uh, so you're a natural connector. Yeah, yeah. So Anton, I mean, we're at the end of our interview um, and I always have a final question. And that final question is, what kind of recommendations do you want to give to the audience? And it may be a layered uh, recommendation. So maybe uh, one kind of recommendation for entrepreneurial people out there, uh, other parts of uh, recommendations for designers, and it could be just that holistic overall um, recommendation to the audience. Something you want to, you want to leave them with. And it could be pointers to resources or ideas or or books or things like that that you want to refer them to, or it could be just general uh, recommendations. I think my general recommendation usually is just uh, about uh, paying attention to your curiosity. And uh, I'm thinking the curiosity is not just intellectual curiosity or um, <clears throat> think in your mind, it is very much connected to your body as well. So uh, it's just kind of like a hint, I guess. Like it was a hint for me. So like the curiosity happens in your body and kind of like following that uh, is uh, what makes it interesting for uh, me, for sure. And I, I hope for other people as well. And So this multi-modality you talked about earlier, you, you're really saying having a multi-modality curiosity. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to put it uh for sure yeah, yeah you could call it mmc multimodality uh, curiosity so mmc <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh, one of the uh ways we talk about our thesis in the fund is about building with big ears and we love founders with big ears that's just Kind of like, you know, uh, the ears help you listen to your customers and build this short feedback back loops that allow you to navigate better and not just, uh, you know, be randomly out there. So you're a startup founders now. You've extended the MMC model, the MMCL. So <laughs> MMCL, which is multimodal curiosity and listening. Yes, that's that. That's really good advice. Uh, do you mind if I borrow that in some of my keynotes? I'll, I'll cite it to you. Sure. It's, yes, that's great advice. You know, Anton, I really enjoyed our time together. You're just a marvelous uh, individual, and in, in what you're doing, and just so many different contribution on so many different uh, modalities and levels. And <laughs> thank you for sharing some of these with our audience today. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely a pleasure for me to be here with you today. And uh, yeah, I'm thankful to Adria for connecting us. And uh, I hope it's not the last conversation of ours. And we chat about something um, more interesting because things develop so fast. Absolutely. In fact, um, I invite you to come to AI for Good in May. I'll send you some background information and maybe we can spend some additional time together. <laughs> so... Sounds good. Sounds good. Yes. I accept your invitation. <laughs> Thank you again. Take care. Take care. Have a good day. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. 
do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.